There was once an attempted coup on the Caribbean Republic of Santa Prisca many years ago. It was a very sad and very short affair. The first of the generals came down swiftly. Emboldened by the going on in nearby Cuba, the people rose up. The dead were buried and the living arrested. The three-day battle in the capital left many questions to be asked and many names to be named. Names to be torn from the mouths of the insurgents. And those named were removed from this world and taken to another. A place called Peña Duro, the hard stone. A woman, heavy with child, was brought to the place. Her unborn to be charged with the crimes of his father under the medieval codes of the island nation. Santa Priscan law is not without mercy. Only a male child could serve the sentence of his father, and he was born a male child, born to life and a life sentence, behind the walls of Peña Duro. But this is not the story of how Bain was born. This is the story of his creation. His mother was imprisoned as well. She was his guardian. They were kept in protective care in the prison's infirmary. But there was another, assigned to Dr. Ruger, banished to Peña Duro for 30 years, was a man they called Zombie. And Zombie watched as the boy grew over the years. He watched as the mother wasted away. Dr. Ruger saw nothing, but Zombie could see her dying a little each day. Hope is also a living thing. It is important to remember that it must be nurtured. But the boy was still a boy. He grew. He thrived. He knew no other place. He learned every hidden corner of Peña Duro. Every secret. It was there he learned of life. And at too tender an age, he learned of other things. By the boy's sixth year, the mother had given up on all life. Zombie alone attended her in those last days. She was a farm girl who could not survive hidden from the sun, and so far from God. The boy would not allow himself a tear. He had become as hard as this place. His mother was weak. For that she died. She was denied a Christian burial. Her corpse was thrown over Punto de Tiburon to be food for the sharks that gathered there. And the boy? The warden sneered from behind the desk and told the little one that his mother had left him quite alone. She had left him without a single guardian but the state. But the state is no one's mother. The boy simply could not expect the same treatment. He must fend for himself. The first night among the beasts was a hundred years long. The boy was to be thrown to the animals within the walls, only a child, and set down among beasts of Peña Dordo. Zombie was restricted to the infirmary block and could not watch over him. The boy sat quietly on his bed, while a man with a face chain from the cell nearest him tells him that he looks frightened and so much alone. The man will protect him from the others. In a place like that, you must have friends. The boy never responded, and the man eventually gave up, telling the boy that there's always manana. And tomorrow always comes. The next morning, the man with the face chain, Puerco, approached the boy again. Perhaps the boy would like to work for him. The boy, small enough as to slip beneath the notice of the guards, will be of great use to him. But then, another man approached. The second man was even far more fearsome than the first. His name was Trog, and he had killed more than 20 men there at Peña Doro, more than double the number he had killed to be sent to that earthly hell. The two men began to fight over the future of the boy. The boy, with no say of his own, back to the railing of the third story walkway, clutching his bear closely as he watched the new normal of his life playing out in front of him. Poor placement was always the boy's curse. He was knocked over the railing and fell to the hard, unforgiving floor. Everything began to fade to black. It was one of the first comforts he ever knew. The boy died that day, and the man 
was created. But when a light appeared in the distance, and a stuffed animal sprang up and ran to it, the boy could not help but wonder what had gotten into little Osito. The light shone bright, but still the bear ran forward, and so he followed. The closer the boy drew, the brighter the light became, until finally, the boy asked the identity of the person producing the light. The man told the boy that there is no one but himself. He is who the boy will be years from now, what he will become. He is the living embodiment of human superiority. He told the boy that the blood of kings ran through his blood, the blood of his father. Only a few may rule the many, and the boy is but one of a rare breed. However, there is still one looming threat that remains. Fear. The fear that lay within the heart. Only this could keep the boy's dominance at bay. He must conquer it, and only then will he have anything he desires. Only then will he be second to no man, and master of all. The boy returned to the world from his coma 30 days after his fall, and he returned no longer a child. It was a simple thing to follow the trail of blood. The warden bellowed out to the guards that it was the boy. He awoke from his coma turned feral. The warden refused to have such abominations in his prison. The boy was nothing more than a bane to everything holy, and so he is named. The prison guards attempted to take Bane away to the Cavidad Escuro within the handcuffs, but the chains proved to be too large for the boy. They slipped right off. No matter, stated the warden. By the time Bane returned to see light of the sun, the chains will fit snugly around his wrists. This time, Bane had the last word. Bane tells the warden that he spoke with his mother last night, and she told him that they were stroking a special fire just for the warden. The words had shaken the warden, and many heard them. The Cavidad Escuro was dug by clergy three centuries ago. Those sent there by priests were told to pray for deliverance. The only deliverance found was madness or death, and he would surrender to neither. He stared into the darkness of that pit and became a part of it. And Bane purged fear from his heart, and he survived. The cell was below the level of the sea at high tide. Each night the ocean would flood it, and each night Bane would fight for his life. Hatred gave him the strength to hold on. Hatred and the promise of the man he would become. He soon learned to welcome the nightly visits of the sea. They allowed him to mark the days. It brought him food. It brought him life. And in all those days, he heard no voice but his own. Welded into a 5 by 10 foot cell, his entire world was the length of three short paces, but they would not confine his mind. In his mind, he traveled beyond his tomb. He traveled outside those walls using meditation techniques all his own. However, he had no words for these techniques. They grew from utter desolation and crushing boredom. He roamed worlds undreamed of. Space and time were playthings to him, and in each place he sought out the bad thing that fluttered in his heart. And there he stood before it, stood in its shadow and defied it, and finally killed it. Fear died in him. More than 4,000 days Bane was down in that pit, more than 10 years of waiting. He embarrassed the warden by refusing to die. He was released and hoped that someone would seek revenge for Puerco's murder. But the warden did not realize what Bane had become to the lost and damned of Puenadoro. He had become a legend, and many wanted his favor, and many wanted to serve him. One was an American, a man from a place named Gotham, called Bird. Bird had hopes of flying out of their cage and returning to the city once again in the future. Bane had become a model prisoner, a tame animal. The warden allowed him to work in the library. Once, part of the prison had been a monastery. The monks had thousands of books, 
and the books brought the world to him. Soon, Bane was reading three books a day. He learned to read in six languages. There was a power in knowing things. When he had consumed all of the prison's library, he sought more. Where others had drugs and tobacco and sweets smuggled in, Bane used his network to bring him books. Hundreds of books on every subject matter. And as he improved his mind, he improved his body. A thousand push-ups each day. A thousand sit-ups. A thousand pull-ups. And instead of sleep, he meditated four hours each night. And each day of each year brought him closer to the image of perfection in his mind. His reign over the loss of Peñadoro did not go unchallenged. Many coveted his position and his power. But they had only brutality and greed to give them strength. Bane drew his power from the very rock of that place. No one would take that from him. There was no place like Gotham, Bird once told him. It's the greatest city on the planet. Anything a guy could want is on sale there. It's like a big piece of ripe fruit. And it's everything to him. But every kingdom needs its leader. Who rules Gotham? Bane questions. But that's a tough one, Bird would say. If he had to guess, he'd say, Batman runs Gotham. Nobody knows who Batman is, or what his game is. But Gotham After Dark is his. Batman has taken down every major hood in the city. The only ones who aren't scared of him are crazy. The idea of Batman, of a king of fear, of a king to be conquered. Bane made a vow to not only meet the Batman, but destroy him. No one knows what there was in the mention of Batman that made the change in Bane, but it inflamed his imagination. It fueled his dreams. From then on, Batman became his obsession and his purpose.